So I'm happy to introduce the, um, the panelists. I'm going to do that very quickly. Um, first of all, First of all, I have to say that unfortunately two participants are not here today. It's first of all, it's Markus Miesen and also Ingrid Commandeur. We're very sad that both can't be here, but we still have a great panel up here. Uh, um, the first one that you see on your left is Gabriele Knappstein, the curator of this museum here and um, the chief curator and she's also the co-curator of the Black Mountain exhibition. She will speak about a project that took place here during the exhibition called Collaborating with Different Art Schools and Universities in the Project Performing the Black Mountain Archive. Then Patrick Müller, right next to Gabriele Knappstein, he will, he's a professor at Zürich Hochschule der Künste, founder and head of, head of the Master of Arts in Transdisciplinary Studies at ZHDK and director of Connecting Spaces Hong Kong Zürich, a platform for transcultural exchange. He will give us a critical reflection of the concept of interdisciplinarity in his statement on transdisciplinarity and the dilettantism as a strategy. Then uh, Nina Mantmann, in the middle, uh, a curator and writer, professor of art theory and history of ideas at the Royal Institute of Art in Stockholm in Sweden. She will speak about transformation of the institutional realm in her statement, how to protect the students from being disappointed. Um, in the middle, <laughs> In the middle, you see Claudia Olk, uh, our moderator for the panel. She's the Dean of the Faculty of Philosophy and Humanities at Freie Universität Berlin. Then next to her, Irene Campolmi, um, an Italian researcher, PhD fellow and curatorial assistant at the Louisiana Museum in Denmark. Uh, she reconsiders research through the practice of curating and talks about the museum experience between the discursive and the immersive, a subject on which she's on which she organizes a conference at Louisiana Museum in December. And finally, Julian Klein, a Berlin-based composer, stage director, researcher, and director of the Institute for Artistic Research in Berlin. He teaches experimental music theater at the Universität der Künste in Berlin and performance at Hochschule für Musik und Darstellende Kunst in Frankfurt am Main. And his statement will concern the benefits and challenges of collaboration. So please welcome our panelists. Thank you very much for Werner for your kind words and thank you very much everybody for coming. I'm delighted to see so many of you here and there's still some seats in the front so nobody has to stand up so please feel free to just join us up here. Um, yes, I mean we've only just heard that um, Black Mountain College remains this imaginary space for us and the part of the great appeal of the exhibition that we were witnessing over the past month is, of course, a kind of escapism. Also, you know, when seeing all the exhibits and so trying to soak in some of the spirit that really made up Black Mountain College, some of us, many, I think, uh, would rather think, you know, why don't we do something ourselves? You know, why don't we just, you know, quit our jobs and, you know, build up our own Black Mountain College? <laughs> But it also inspires us to think about collaborations between the academia and the art world today under the various conditions that our speakers have sort of outlined to us, you know. Um, and these are questions that we are going to address in this panel. Also, where are the limits of collaboration and interdisciplinarity? And what does it take for us to get our students involved in this kind of spirit? So with us today, all our panelists really are at home in both worlds, both in the academia and in the art world as practitioners and professionals. And we did ask each one of them to provide a short statement um, before we get, in, get the discussion going amongst ourselves. And then, of course, we are going to open it up to the plenary. And I'd like to ask them now to really well, why not in alphabetical order to read out their statements? So, would you like to start? Yeah. Can pull me. Certainly. So, um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, today, I, I would like to, to talk about museum research, and uh, I will just go to the core of my presentation by saying that um, exhibition can become a basis for um, 
basically for research in action uh, methodologies and uh, for providing different kinds of knowledge. And we have discussed a lot what knowledge is. And today we take for granted that museums are site for knowledge productions and uh, critical reflections, but those of us who are working in museums are now asked to clarify what exactly is uh, knowledge and how museums uh, produce this knowledge. And the ongoing discourse has been based uh, on the academic knowledge and um, on the way in which basically visitors interact with works of art, uh, creating this kind of both intellectual and also uh, bodily uh, knowledge. But um, the thing is, how can we uh, define as uh, knowledge this interaction with art? And also what is the value of uh, uh, of this knowledge in both research, uh, um, academic research and uh, museum research. Because if we look at uh, academic research, knowledge is, um, I would say, this um, uh, investigation, methodological investigation uh, that is aimed to prove or disprove uh, certain thesis and the results of this investigation are then published in a peer review essay. But when we look at art museum, we cannot, we cannot call museum research, uh, uh, we can measure, let's say, the, the research of, an, of a museum just by the peer-reviewed uh, articles that are published by its staff, because museums are basically creating knowledge uh, in many different fields, and therefore they are also engaged in different kinds of research, if we want to call it like this. And uh, being a, I think, I mean, I think that now what we, uh, we should encourage is uh, collaboration, of course, between museum professionals and uh, academic researchers to address uh, actually how to evaluate the quality of this research. And at the same time, I would say, um, what vehicles uh, uh, can be used to communicate and uh, the, the results of this knowledge and also the quality of this knowledge. I mean, as a curator or um, assistant curator, I, I think that um, exhibitions, they have this um, exhibition and also uh, collection displays, they have the potential uh, to become, um, uh, the, I would say, basis for uh, research in action because, because they are the uh, vocabulary through which the museum communicate. And, uh, and also through which it can articulate uh, uh, a meaningful statement, but at the same time also uh, explore what kind of, uh, what is knowledge and how this, you know, uh, knowledge can be articulated uh, um, in a different way. Um, and I would say also that um, at the same time, there is an existing lack of uh, uh, methods to, or parameters to judge what knowledge is because um, I'm coming from a museum where uh, museum research is not considered the exhibition making practice, but at the same time, um, we are aware that um, the museum research, uh, contrary to the academic research, is meant to be uh, communicate uh, to a larger public. And that also involves uh, a bodily and uh, a sensorial experience. So, um, Throughout our uh, curatorial research, uh, we don't dare to, and we don't want to negate the fact that um, that the framework used for academic research is still a fundamental point of departure for making exhibitions. But at the same time, uh, we would like to um, to see that the exhibition is a is you know uh, a way to start a research in action, and at the same time is. Is, um, is the beginning of a journey that then leads to different kind of uh, uh, interpretations, but also, you know, destination, I would say. And if we think about research um, as something that goes beyond the discursive uh, dimension that is created by a catalog, but also by, by the, you know, the discursive layers that are present in an exhibition, and we start thinking about um, uh, the immersive experience that the exhibition creates, then it's also important to see that such immersive exhibition, they activate a, um, a synesthetic uh, system. And this synesthetic system activates a different kind of knowledge. Yesterday, um, uh, Elkins El 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 called it phenom phenomenal uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, we call it like sensorial, but I mean, 
we can call it in the way we, we would like because we are the one, you know, creating the vocabulary, I would say. So um, that's, that is one of the reasons why, um, you can go through the slides, that is one of the reasons why, um, while dealing with, this, uh, with these problems, uh, we, we basically decided to um, engage in, this, in, in, the research, in researching or in understanding what, kind, what is the museum research. Also because uh, from, from the Ministry of Culture in Denmark, we were asked to, uh, to define what is the, strat the museum research strategy. And, and therefore we wanted to, under to underline this point. And uh, we, we um, as the Louisiana Research, uh, the newborn Louisiana Research uh, Department, um, has decided to launch this conference, which is called indeed uh, Between the Immersive and the Discursive. And, um, we would like what the aim of the conference is not only, of course, to be a forum where, where people, uh, researcher, artists, and uh, uh, museum professionals can come and gather and uh, exchange uh, their ideas on the topic, but at the same time, I think that we would like to understand, to emphasize that by expanding the boundaries of research methodology, we are trying to establish uh, an alternative and an unconventional experien exper experiential models of researching, but also of curating. And, uh, and I would like to conclude by saying that it's here in this hybrid uh, definition, in this definition, sorry, of um, hybrid uh, um, kinds of knowledge that museum can really play uh, a role and that can make a difference because uh, they can outline what a research methodology is for a museum, uh, complete also with its own evaluation criteria and its outcome measurements. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. The PowerPoint went a little bit, <laughs> not, not in synchrony, but it was okay. <laughs> yeah, we will, we will have lots to talk about, so that's for sure. The next is Julian Klein, please. Yeah, I'd like to thank you for this invitation. And um, uh, first of all, I have to say um, the Institute for Autistic Research, where I'm happy to be a member of, is not a school. Uh, we are placed at a theater, and therefore we are an extra-universitarian research institute. So um, we use the artistic mode to, as a tool for gaining knowledge. And uh, we are collaborating with universities, but we are not a school on our own purpose. And uh, we employ PhD students, uh, like any other uh, research institutes, but uh, they are educated at the universities and they are just working and co collaborating with us in our research projects. So, so to speak, senior research is what we do. Um, and, uh, but that leads uh, to, yeah, um, to the question of whether the, the Humboldtian ideal of the unity of research and education can be installed as well in the uh, art world, because especially here in Germany, um, the artistic education is done at the art schools, but the artistic work is done outside, also the artistic research. And that's a pity, uh, kind of a pity, and I'm dreaming of to reunite these kinds of uh, endeavors. And the second uh, point I'd like to mention is about interdisciplinarity, because we have lots of uh, collaborations with um, scientific disciplines and within the humanities and with other artistic disciplines. And what often is overseen is that interdisciplinary work needs a lot of investment. So lots of the projects we start take like one or two years of only discussion and learning from each other before being able to start a proper project. And that's why interdisciplinary work is so seldom uh, um, and, and so yeah, difficult to undertake because there's 
so little room for this kind of investment and so little support for that. Um, there, are, um, uh, uh, there are exceptions, of course, uh, like uh, the Young Academy uh, at the Berlin Brandenburgische Akademie der Wissenschaften and the National Academy Leopoldina, where I luckily was uh, elected a member for five years. Um, the, the period is restricted to five years, I have to say. And, um, uh, and uh, as I was um, grown out of this institution, I constantly search for other possibilities to place this kind of work we were, were allowed to do there. And uh, what was the advantage that is, and there I would like to support Dieter with his, uh, yeah, with his plea, um, we had the trust uh, as 50 members of an academy being there five years together, having money to do something. Um, and so uh, that is what, what, uh, what is really needed is to have more possibilities uh, to start projects uh, just from scratch and not claiming anything in advance. Uh, and that was uh, the, the real uh, advantage of, of uh, interdisciplinary work, because you may have an overview of what you are doing in your own discipline, but as long as it comes to collaboration, no one can do this before having started this process. And uh, that is, yeah, um, uh, the, the, the real need is to have a system of sandboxes and support and trust, and that's what the difference is to what we have now. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and we move on to Gabriele Knappstein. <laughs> okay. um, um, if you allow me, uh, I make a short remark uh, to the colleague from, from the dance. Um, uh, you, you asked why there's so much um, uh, exhibitions also coming up about uh, tendencies from the 60s or Black Mountain College now. Um, and I would say from my perspective, uh, I think it comes very late because uh, if you look uh, at how the history of the avant-garde has been told uh, for, for many, many years and decades, it was a choice of masterworks from the collection, the same way as we presented the works of Rauschenberg and Twombly that were uh, starting points for this exhibition in our collection. Um, and uh, we were looking for a different model of um, telling this narrative about uh, these works and a few others that you now see in the show, um, namely, um, focusing more on the context and process in which these kind of works were made and in which um, uh, situations of uh, exchange and inspiration between artists, then focusing only on the uh, results, the, the masterpieces. So this was quite a challenge for us to look for um, a different model of presentation and narrative for works we had shown uh, previously in a very different way. And I think um, it's wonderful that meanwhile uh, you have a very serious, seriously researched exhibition about the EAT um, uh, movement, uh, as you can find it now in Salzburg. I think a lot of this information was also lacking, lacking for a broader audience because a lot of this material is hidden in archives, is hidden with the artists themselves, and is not valued by the art market. It's growing, the value of this material, but so far uh, it's not valued uh, with high prices, and I think this is a big chance of working with this material as a a museum person, just maybe this is one uh, aspect uh, explaining uh, a little bit uh, about the model that we have chosen uh, when 
we now present works from our collection and from other collections in Berlin in a different uh, context and way of presentation. Um, and the other aspect that you were mentioning was more the side of uh, the active artist. Why is so much reenactment or uh, relying on 60s practice going on, which I would not comment, but uh, I hope the first part of your question uh, is maybe uh, approached by my comment. Um, for this statement, I just want to um, present uh, one of the collaborations that were also uh, fundamental for our projects, besides the cooperation with uh, Freie Universität Berlin and Dahlem Humanity Center, which enabled us to have two symposiums and to have this blog, the www.black-mountain-research.com uh, website. Both of these uh, platforms couldn't have been realized by our own. Um, and I would say that this uh, needs for color collaboration also comes out of um, a need to uh, cross certain boundaries that we feel stuck in in our institution and daily practice in a very small team uh, burdened with a lot of uh, bureaucracy which is probably uh, what a lot of colleagues of mine experience and um, we thought that uh, collaboration and um, um, bringing resources together can help us uh, to create an energy that we ourselves with our resources might not be able to, to raise with a small team and with a budget that, that we have. So we tried uh, these uh, forms of collaboration which enable us to um, um, deepen and also wide the uh, possibilities of a project that we want to realize. And the second collaboration that was fundamental for our exhibition is the invitation to the artist Arnold Dreiblatt, who um, created the score performing the Black Mountain Archive. And uh, we approached him at the beginning of our <coughs> exhibition project because we uh, were unsatisfied in um, presenting a narrative about the Black Mountain College which is just a historic uh, narrative, and we asked ourselves how we can bring it into a um, present activity, and uh, Arnold Reiblatt has a lot of experience with um, questions of visualizing and activating archival material. That's why we approached him at the beginning, and he came up with this proposal to write a score, uh, a time, Bracket score, a compositional me method that mirrors, in a way, uh, Cage's score for the uh, untitled event piece, and to uh, invite student groups from different art schools and universities to perform this score in the exhibition. And this was an experiment we agreed to do together uh, under the conditions that uh, we could offer as an institution, we had to open uh, the exhibition and the exhibition space to a daily activity of four to 10 art students. Every week or every two weeks, a new group came from different universities, and uh, we are very thankful uh, to all these partners who made it possible that these performing the Black Mountain Archive could be realized. It was the uh, Universität der Künste, the Sound Studies Department, the Hochschulübergreifende Zentrum Tanz in Berlin, the Rheinisch Friedrich Wilhelms Universität Bonn North American Studies Program, the Hochschule für Bildende Künste Dresden, the Visual Arts Section, Muthesius Kunst Hochschule Kiel, Medienkunst, Typography, Hochschule der Künste Bern, Performance Art, die Kunstakademie in Oslo from the Visual Arts Section, 
the Norwegian Theater Academy in Fredrikstad. And now, until tomorrow, we have students here from Stockholm, from the um, Art Academy, uh, from the Visual Arts section. And all these groups came here, as I said, for one or two weeks as a residency in the exhibition, which is a structure which uh, made it possible to do this project at all, which means the different um, universities and um, academies participated in our project and we tried to um, reduce bureaucracy as much as we could in that we invited Arnold Project, Arnold Treiblatt with an artist project. That's the framework of how we realize this um, uh, activity and uh, without the collaborators it wouldn't have been possible uh, to do it and um, what I experienced in this process of collaborating that it was um, absolutely um, interesting to rely on um, different groups that work for certain periods autonomously and then to bring together the efforts from all these different angles without as a curator of the project being able to control or wanting to control all the processes uh, going on in these different fields, meaning uh, uh, letting the students uh, fill the blog um, without uh, reading the articles um, beforehand or um, doing a, a, a process of evaluating it, uh, leaving the space for the students in the exhibition up to them to uh, create and rely in the situation in that they are performing um, and give them an space in which they can perform and develop uh, their way to, to perform and also to react to this invitation. That was a very um, inspiring um, experiment, I must say, and I want to quote at the end um, one uh, phrase that Arnold Treiblatt uh, uh, was mentioning in his text about his project, referring to Olsen's uh, idea uh, of sharing uh, a public forum, and uh, I think this was a very interesting uh, quotation describing what uh, Charles Olsen also had in mind when working with the students um, that it's about the presence of the past is felt more intensely in the here and now. The body that is the police carries with it a collective memory anchored to the specific space and the rituals performed within this space where it really took place revitalize and preserve the memory by sharing it time and again by experiencing the event. The story, the myth, are always in the present, and all the citizens of the town take part in it, narrate it, create it. The polis as a social form is based on the actualization of the past for the sake of self-growth. And I hope also our audience participated and will participate until tomorrow. Thank you. Very much. Lots of examples that <laughs> We're a little pressed for time, so I don't want to cut off your applause, which you truly deserve. I'm, I must apologize. But we need to move on to one participant who is from Stockholm, an example that also got mentioned, Nina Möntmann. Hello, everybody. I'm um, connecting a little bit to what Dieter Lesage said on the devastating impact of neoliberalism on um, education. So I will focus on the aspects here that are central to my statements, um, statement which are the tools used by neoliberalism to control education. Those are bureaucracy, managerialism, and high tuition fees. Since neoliberalism cannot deal with subjectivity, with the immeasurability of education, bureaucracy serves as a tool to control any kind of vagueness or uncertainty 
For example, by applying efficiency criteria that standardize expected outcomes and therefore also promote mediocrity. Um, managerialism enforces the corporatization of universities and the marketization of higher education and high tuition fees created a student loan crisis in many countries including the US and the UK that is pushing students into the market at an alarmingly rapid rate. In response to this crisis of educational institutions, artists and curators have set up new initiatives and spaces outside of the official establishments. There are examples like the Copenhagen Free University, that's the first image please, which ran from 2001 to 2007, dedicated to the production of critical consciousness and poetic language. The Open School East in London, which provides free workspaces for the period of one academic year, as well as free tuition by international artists, writers, curators, and theorists. Or the Mountain School of Arts, established by Eric Wesley and uh, Piero Goglia in Los Angeles in 2005, and many, many other examples. <clears throat> the aims of these organizations are directly opposed to bureaucracy, to managerialism, and tuition fees. Their mission is to enable learning as a non-target-oriented, free and collective process. But what relationship do these small self-organized initiatives have to the official educational sector? And how might these relationships be reimagined? With a letter meant to intimidate or even criminalize the Copenhagen Free University, the Danish government delivered a proof of the fact that the approaches of alternative educational initiatives are seen as effective and therefore as a threat to the official system. That's the next image, please. In 2010, three years after they had closed down already, the CFU received a letter from the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation informing them about a new law stipulating that the name university was no longer allowed for non-governmental institutions. They warned the CFU that, quoting now, in case the Copenhagen Free University should resume its educational activities, it would be included under the prohibition in the university law, paragraph 33. According to this changed law, the term, the term university could only be used by institutions authorized by the state of Denmark. The CFU was told that this was, and I'm quoting again, to protect students from being disappointed. <laughs> it could, of course, be argued that students might be more disappointed by jaded professors and a ready-made form of education. At this point in time, it's particularly important to find out how being a threat to the official system might be used to advantage. That's the next image. I see two approaches. The alternative one, stay away from power and find local alternatives. It's about withdrawing. Commons is one very popular concept. Theoretical backup we find in Negrihad or B4, for example. The other one is more of an operational approach, confronting power, creating new institutions and infrastructures that are able to operate locally and change globally. Backup comes here from Chantal Mouffe or Mark Fischer. Since to my mind, public institutions such as art academies are in crisis in different countries to different extents, I see a need to reoccupy them as facilitators of public interest. Therefore, it's a matter of political urgency to overcome this dichotomy we see here, to use the experience gathered by alternative spaces in the realm beyond bureaucracy, managerialism, and high tuition fees, and to integrate this knowledge into the official, into, into the official, official institutional terrain by occupying existing structures or establishing new official ones. Commons is, for example, a good model to reflect on how to share new institutions. But I would be critical of the utopian aspect of the model of commons. Um, 
which is about everybody agreeing on everything, everybody getting along with everybody, and so on. When I imagine Chantal Mouffe's concept of a conflictual, agonistic space merging with elements of the commons like equal access, responsible use of resources, and fair play, this could be a good fundament in thinking new institutions. In a slightly different context, Beatrice von Bismarck talked about a game within the game. And this is exactly what is needed here. The implementation of a new game with new rules, not only as alternatives to, but also inside existing structures, changing them from within, not being scared of by power structures, but attempting to redefine them. The next step of institutional critique has to include critical management. Thank you. And last, but certainly not least, Patrick Müller, please. Yes, <coughs> okay, thank you for the invitation and also the introduction. Um, <coughs> I chose a little bit a different approach. Um, was thinking uh, about the presentation today also about a more pedagogical, pedagogical setting or kind of the vision um, of it, and it's only a small aspect. I um, start with some uh, historical references at Black Mountain College and then come to uh, our time. When Joseph Albers published in uh, his text concerning art instruction in the second Black Mountain College Bolta, he opened his argumentation uh, with the projected sentence. You don't have it? There is it on the... Ah, the format is not compatible. Okay, so I read it. When Rembrandt was asked how one learns to paint, he is said to have answered, one must take a brush and begin. This is the answer of genius which grows without school and even in spite of schooling. At the same time, we know that he had a teacher and became a teacher. I will not go deeper in, uh, into the text now and its prototypical arguments about art education, but I would like to take this quote as a starting point. The idea of the self-taught artist without school or in spite of schooling has not only been a rhetoric figure for Albers and may of course be a perhaps questionable topos in art education anyway, but also a certain reality, be it in Albers Bauhaus time or later at Black Mountain College. One of his famous colleagues at the Bauhaus who did another important transfer of the Bauhaus aesthetic to the US, uh, Laszlo Moholinage, was formerly untrained and was sometimes called a dilettant. Buckminster Fuller, we heard it uh, today, to name another example, did not have a formal education in the fields. He had been working either, gave up his, his studies at Harvard at an early stage. And the same can be said of the teaching itself. John Rice was in a reflective way aware of the fact that some of the teachers he hired had not been teaching before, they were just artists. The fact that, this, uh, that his faculty also developed completely new concepts of educational processes may have to do with that as well. Um, obviously, they didn't have uh, quality managers at that time. Explain that to them. Another example is John Cage. Having, as uh, we would say today, a very hybrid educational career, one of his private teachers, Arnold Schoenberg, was himself an autodidact uh, who compensated, perhaps even overcompensated, this fact throughout his artistic career. The deficit that Schoenberg detected in Cage's personal disposition is well known, no feeling of harmony, and this deficiency would limit him like a wall, Schoenberg said. Cage answered, in that case, I will devote my life to beating my head against that wall. Uh, famous quote, I know. A certain aversion towards the classical standards of education, Bildung, can be seen throughout Cage's career, and it was expressed uh, especially in his earlier times the short uh, statement reflecting the white paintings by Robert Rauschenberg is full of it. You can't see it now, it is also exhibited in the exhibition. Uh, it starts with no beauty, no talent, and so on. Sorry that you can't read it, I haven't uh, the text in that copy. But it says, very short text about uh, Rauschenberg, no taste. So uh, something acquired uh, in an educational process, Bildung in the Kantian sense, uh, I just uh, try to summarize kind of the aversion uh, towards the classical canon. No beauty, 
Another quote, a, of course, in the 20th century, strongly questioned aspiration in art education, perhaps. No talent uh, as a usually unquestioned prerequisite for developing mastery uh, in what field ever. No idea, no intention. So an absence of self-reflectivity and frames uh, of reference. Finally, no technique. At least this would have been something that an art instruction uh, could be aiming at. The effectiveness of the sting cage placed with the opposition of Ludwig van Beethoven and Eric Satie in his first appearance at Black Mountain College has not to do so much, or not only, with the opposition of harmony uh, versus duration, but uh, perhaps with the contraposition of the model, the symbol of the erudite virtuoso genius, Beethoven, and to name it now, the dilettant, Eric Satie. Another dropout, by the way. The figure of the dilettant also appears sometimes in the recollections of the Black Mountain events. Eric Bentley, to name an example, um, the translator of Bert Brecht and also active uh, at Black Mountain College, was assuming that dilettantism, I quote, dilettantism was at Black Mountain College somehow more identified with life than mere knowledge. So what I would like to propose here as an idea, perhaps a bit provocatively, is the evaluation of the uh, of dilettantism, or perhaps rather dilettantism as a strategy for art education, perhaps also a subversive strategy as a counterstroke to the notion of employability and market success. There is a certain danger here, of course. Running a master program in transdisciplinary studies at the Nato University, where I come from, the reproach of dilettantism is often quite endangering. And all what we do not want, of course, is to educate uh, universal dilettants, people that can do everything but nothing in the right way. But if you look at this key figure, the dilettant, you see that it um, often emerged in terms of eras, even if the function maintains radically. Around 1800 in Europe, the dilettant had an important function in the empowerment of civil society, Goethe, he considered himself as a dilettant in the fields of painting and natural sciences, acting, and that's the idea, not only receptively, but actively trying out the relevant practices, learning by doing, so not only kind of watching at the picture, but also doing it uh, by himself, not as a painter, but as a spectator. For Max Weber, around 1900, the dilettant was a close friend of the sudden idea, the Einfall, cracking the lack of perspectives. And in the avant-garde movements, I was reflecting an example by Cage, the aversions towards the classical educational canon and its procedures attempted to bring life and art in a closer connection. Today, there is, of course, again another situation. In many fields of the arts and its neighbors, interdisciplinary approaches are not the exception anymore. Um, but partly at least a new standard, be it on a medial level or between the arts or between the arts and other disciplines or also everyday practices. We heard a lot of examples already. More precisely, there is at least at art university, but also in the art fields in general, a strong divide between specialization in a clearly defined discipline and the specialization in practices that can be named uh, with uh, prefixes like inter, trans, multi, cross. Working in the latter field, the involved agents, involved people, or in involved professionals having different uh, disciplinary backgrounds always have at least two, pers um, uh, uh, two perspectives in constant communication, but also in constant flux the own and the other discipline or disciplines. Practicing the other discipline may then be one approach, not to make an artist out of a scientist, a dancer out, uh, out of an architect or a visual artist out of a musician, but bet to better understand the processes in, involved in the uh, respective practice. Um, also and foremost, probably on a non-propositional level, and uh, with this also to increase the connectivity or at least the potential. In the more interesting case, this has on the other hand also an effect uh, on the own discipline, the own practice. It often poses very basic questions about overcome or at least classical divisions of labor, hierarchies, working procedures, and so on. Often it is compulsory to adjust them, to find new solutions, to learn their own discipline partly anew. 
self-reflectivity then is not the goal in itself, but it has a specific function which is necessary for uh, interdisciplinary cooperation. And I would agree um, with you that, of course, this needs time, a lot of time, uh, also time for failure, for errors. Um, yes. So in both cases, um, in the own and the other discipline, you risk to be a dilettant, at least for a certain amount of time. Um, and um, perhaps an institutional perspective uh, to uh, close my statement, um, when Eric Bentley left the Black Mountain College, um, because he probably was too much focusing on knowledge and not so much uh, on process, um, the faculty um, argued that two different kinds of colleges in the same place at the same time were not possible. Black Mountain College had 30 to 50 students. Uh, the art university where I come from has 2,000 students. So there are probably different um, institutions possible in one uh, institutions. So I think that it's important to have these more freer, more explorative and more process-oriented spaces in our universities. I also think that they will have an effect uh, on the whole um, institutions. Yes, when I sent you the, the abstract, I had the last sentence, which I still like. Also, we have a certain sympathy for dilett dilettantism. There is already enough professionalism. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, let, let me take you right up on, on this last statement, and I think it did reflect in many of the other statements as well, when we spoke about immersion, when we spoke about collaboration with our students, you know, there's a saying in, in Zen Buddhism that goes, um, in the be beginner's mind there are many possibilities, in the expert's mind there are very few. So, you know, as we tend to know our learning curve sort of slows down. We tend to play not to lose. We narrow our options, you know, we take less chances and all this comes at a cost. Yeah, we stop learning, we stop growing. So how do you, can you give me some examples? How do you get your students involved in collaborations? How do you get them excited in them? It's a very practical question before we come to the political dimension. Who would like to start? I mean, of course, it's uh, the most important that, that uh, you yourself are excited about something and then try to bring that across. And um, to involve students, I'm working at a school that where students work in a very individualist way. And uh, I wanted to try to foster collaboration and that they work together, that they prepare topics together to present in the seminar, that they have working groups, that they read a text together, they talk about it, they collect images, they discuss artworks and um, so on. So that there is um, a discussion that's not only taking place in the seminar with me, with me being present, but also like outside among the students in specific groups. Yes, perhaps I can say we have the advantage uh, that in that master program, which is called in transdisciplinary studies, so that we kind of attract people who are usually curious, curious and of course interested in interdisciplinary work. They are often so curious that they have a problem to focus. That's rather the problem. So they engage strongly, but it's sometimes uh, difficult to find a uh, um, direction. Um, so there is not so much to do. I think what uh, we can do is to open a space where, I sometimes say community, it's a bit romantic, but where kind of uh, a context is where you can trust in, in each other, where um, you get uh, inputs from different uh, direction, which can be, uh, go in very different directions. Um, and again, they kind of, um, need time. So our students, they, um, it's also at the beginning very often not so clearly defined, will it be art or not, <laughs> which is sometimes a discussion. But I don't think that uh, all the results of these uh, interdisciplinary um, approaches have to have art as the, um, yes, last um, aim. 
So sometimes I prefer, or I like very much the, the projects where you can't really tell what exactly it is or they change completely when they get into different contexts. Thank you. Yeah. Does that relate to your idea of immersion? I mean, what, can you sort of flesh it out a little bit for us? Yeah, I think that um, what, what you mentioned about, you know, the, um, the, the cure for, you know, the collaboration between, uh, between I would say, museums and, uh, and, and the visitors. Um, from my experience at the museum at, at Louisiana, um, let's, we don't see a collaboration as a, a way, you know, um, somehow to involve the public in giving the content of an exhibition, but a collaboration is, is, is made when the, um, from both sides there is a, a, like a, a, we put the energy in so we we engage in, in thinking about uh, and we we we, um, uh, we engage in creating a collaborative space where where the visitors collaborate themselves it's not like a mutual collaboration in creating the content, like uh, maybe some, some of you have, have read about you know, Nina Simon and the participatory museum where uh, she, she in kind of you know, asked um, to curators of her museum, of the Santa Cruz, uh, to work together with the public. Because many times, we don't even, as, a, as visitors, we don't even want to be activated too much. You know, some, sometimes we, we need to have a, a, a we, we don't need to be asked so many questions, but we would like also to hear some, some answers, you know, from, from the institution. And that's why, why I say that uh, somehow the, the exhibition becomes, you know, a stage, just a platform where we work to create something and the visitors, they, they get inspiration to do something else. Maybe something that is also, you know, based on the museum, but maybe something else, something completely different. Very important. So um, the students, uh, we have the honor and the pleasure to work with in our projects, are already excited when they apply. So I think there is no need to, to enhance this, but uh, we, we face the problem to keep the excitement alive through the process. Yeah? Uh, that is, uh, you may, know the quote uh, that uh, art is fun, but it needs a lot of work. And of course, that's, uh, yeah, that's the challenge. Right, yeah. But how, I mean, considering today's political sort of climate, yeah, uh, we seem to be facing a fundamental paradox in a way. I mean, on the one hand, the art market has become such a strong economic factor in itself, you know, if you think of artists like Jeff Koons and others, you know, it's really sort of marketable property. And on the other hand, um, institutional engagement with art, the academy, the museums, any kind of public institution is suffering from severe cuts, sometimes inadequate funding and so on. So there seems to be something off balance. How does that affect your work or what is your perception of this? You know, the current state of affairs, Nina Muntman has sort of elaborated on that as well in your presentation. I think that, that this is of course somehow um, connected, that um, the market is becoming more and more dominant and the institutions are getting corporatized, so it's like one and the same process, I think. And um, what I find um, more interesting to, um, to observe is that uh, there seems to be a gap inside the art world, which is getting bigger and bigger. So you have like this one more market-oriented art, and then you have like another art, another um, um, artistic practices that are maybe more, um, say, discursively oriented, but they find new, also large platforms in, in uh, biennials and um, in uh, bigger exhibitions outside of institutions. So there is, of course, this, um, yeah, well, and, and in this process, I, I think that this gap is, is uh, getting bigger, bigger and bigger. And I think it's interesting to uh, to see like like what kinds of internal mechanisms are functioning in like both of them. Are they, of course, there are also overlaps, correspondences, and so on. But um, what is developing in this um, sector of, say, um, discursively oriented art, political art, whatever? Uh, 
kind of box you want to choose. Um, how, how you describe what, what is developing there on a larger scale with bigger platforms like annuals, which is also not, it's not disconnected from the market, but, but it's like um, a part of the art world that um, developed, whereas the market, was, the market was developing in a more constant and foreseeable way. This was more like um, exploding and so it was developing much faster from one point of time to another. Also, the role that private foundations play. Um, so the issue is not just you know to retreat into a certain kind of privately funded art universe, but to sort of engage them in a sort of dialogue. Because I don't really regard the academia as being a lost institution. I mean, it's very provocative, but I think you can't just stop there. You know, we're all here. So, um, you know, any further thoughts about this idea? You know, how can we enhance collaborations between? the two spheres in the given political climate. Now, yeah, um, I mean, we can collaborate as this project shows and it starts with a conversation and it starts with a uh, decision that one has an urgent topic one wants to deal with from different perspectives uh, and, and then try to come up with a proposal what, how, how this collaboration could work and which form it could uh, develop. But um, I think, um, I mean, from, from, a, from a perspective of a big, big publicly funded institution, uh, I, would, I would say that uh, we have to combine all kinds of approaches. I mean, since we can't collect uh, important artworks from history with our uh, nearly non-existing acquisition budget, we have to uh, look for uh, serious and uh, helpful cooperations with some private collections and in the future we'll have to continue to do that. We have but at the same time, we, we have to cooperate with uh, universities. We have to uh, cooperate with art schools and not um, losing our, our uh, interests and the narratives we want to present to the public out of sight. Right, yeah, thank you very much. Let me just ask one more question before we open up to the sort of general plenary. Um, I mean, when I was a student, back in the 1800s or so, um, interdisciplinarity was still a, a buzzword, yeah? And it, it continues to be so today. Yeah, so any kind of research approach, research proposal, it has to be interdisciplinary, of course, yeah, because interdisciplinary is good. Um, but, you know, what do you, you know, what is your take on this? You know, any, where are the limits, you know? Is interdisciplinarity now sort of kind of fostering the mainstream in a way in which, you know, institutions are just window dressing in order to meet certain requirements? You know, where are the benefits? Where are the downsides? Have you experienced any of these in your work? Um, I would yeah. like to add something um, to my last remark when I said uh, without losing mm -hmm. sight of what, what narrative we want to uh, present to the public, what I think uh, is a big question, uh, not for me, but um, I think this question becomes more urgent and more obvious. Um, I mean, we are a museum for art and uh, artistic practice uh, took up so many different uh, diverse um, ways um, that uh, the question of uh, yeah, art becomes uh, a very difficult one, especially uh, when art products develop more and more into these high price uh, products which have a market. This can go on uh, continuously as long as this money uh, with which you buy these products and there will be always uh, um, fortunes that can. Um, also make this market grow and uh, continue. Um, but uh, uh, I think what we have to discuss uh, what we lose out of sight when we lose out of sight what art should be, could be, will be. 
if I may. Um, I mean, interdisciplinarity as such is, of course, uh, just a tool that may be appropriate or not to one or the other goal. And even then, if it is appropriate, then there remains the question, um, if it's done well, it can be really beneficial. But the, uh, if it's done badly, then it can be dangerous. Uh, and uh, um, as I learned from my colleagues, especially from the natural sciences, is that the most danger of working is interdisciplinary is that uh, the career is being damaged because uh, they are so highly specialized um, that when they just spend one year in an interdisciplinary project, they might be out of focus. And that would be an uh, a challenge to address that in the scientific system. It's not so much about the arts, it's about science that has to be opened up. Yeah, yeah. Yes, only a short remark. I, it's, I also think it's quite ambivalent. This is why I said that transdisciplinary or interdisciplinarity is kind of a new standard. Um, in the sense of that uh, on every uh, school homepage in each second museum, it's clear that, uh, yeah, it's not disciplined, but interdisciplined. And um, institutionally in our university, this has, of course, also a feedback, um, which is not so good because uh, all students, uh, but also the faculty partly, is yeah, if they do something interdisciplinary, it's good, and also they have to do that. And I would think it could be more interesting um, to um, more clearly define what the goals are. So I think for some students, it just doesn't make sense to discipline them yeah, by doing interdisciplinary things, not individually, but in certain direct. So I would be fine, I think it would be, um, Good, as Julian Klein said, not uh, the, the danger of badly done interdisciplinary practices is big. Yeah, it's a bit. Yeah, it cannot be an end in itself. Really. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I was course, generally yes. given a few more minutes until we really have to go into your break before people start leaving, and I'd like to open up um, our panel to questions from the plenary. And there's a question in the first row that has been waiting already. Yeah right here. Do we have a microphone? Yes, we do. <laughs> so actually, it's more a comment. First of all, thank you very much, uh, especially for the concrete examples, because that's the most uh, yeah, important. I mean, with the success of the show here, that it worked out, it can work out. What you were mentioning at the Junge Academie, things are working or not working, but what are the conditions in order to make uh, these experimentation possible within uh, the different institutions or parameters or what Nina was mentioning what what were the examples so thank you very much I was just wanted to add since you were talking about the, the museum and if I understood quite right so it's not to do something for the public but uh, like trying to find like ways to do it within or uh, what comes out of the, the audience in itself. And I was just mm, thinking of an uh, uh, initiative that was uh, taken, I don't know what, what happened to it at uh, the Museum of Modern Art in Barcelona, where, yeah, where, where yeah, with um, Beatriz uh, Presedo, they were trying to find new ways, like how the visitors themselves, how they can, um, integrate them already in programming in different parts. Programming, if it's for programs for the public or uh, the, the exhibition, the exhibition uh, space. So how to get the civil society really engaged and not doing something for them, but rather with them or uh, finding strategies that they can create their program. So I, I, I thought, I don't know where they are right now, but that was an interesting take, what they uh, wanted to do. I, I thank you for, uh, for this comment. And um, you, open, you open up like a, a vast uh, you know, field of, uh, of studies. Um, 
I, I can just talk from, you know, from the practical or professional perspective at the museum where I work, but I know many museums like the Van Habe Museum uh, that are trying to open up, uh, you know, curatorial practice to the public. So they're making actual, or they have made actually in 2013, open call for the public to present their, own, their you know, idea on how to rethink uh, the display, or we talk about, uh, we can talk about Tate Liverpool, they have made like a kind of a focus group where they invited uh, uh, schools, but also, you know, uh, family on the Sunday to say, okay, so in this display, how would you put uh, the things for which reason and like this. Um, but what is the problem of this uh, kind of solution is that we come back to the point that sometimes not, not or let's say like not all the public want to be activated and and when we think that when we go in a gallery and when we go to a museum like we are we want we want to relax we want to have this you know this feeling that we passively you know make our mind working and uh, and we don't want to be bombarded many times by questions by so this is also a balance, this is a strategy this is how each museum it the DNA of each museum you know uh, make the museum then work. Yeah, I was just like to see where are the limits, what you were pointing out. What, the, the limits, like the, the limits risk, that... What, what, what goes, what are the models, yeah. what are the, the concrete Yeah, sorry, the limits, the limits is that uh, many times people do not want to be engaged in, and, and uh, like a case of like the Van Happen, it's, I personally admire it, the work that they have done, but, uh, but they don't have visitors, and they, all the public fi fundings have been cut, and have been cut, and it, it, that's problematic. And, 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 or for example, in Liverpool, you can do such a things just outside, uh, you know, of the mainstream uh, of the of the capitals. Like Tate Modern would never do something like that. Would never ask to people to collaborate. One more quick question. Thanks. Anybody? Yes. Um, thanks for the discussion, some thoughtful remarks. I wondered, uh, for going back to what Julian last said and um, the overall ethos of the Black Mountain College, considering the number of disciplines that participated in it, whether you considered inviting other disciplines onto your panel? Oh, okay. So, <laughs> because at the moment the, fo mm -hmm. the focus is very much on the arts, and I know it is, yes. um, you just said it's uh, it's a, you know we're an mm -hmm. arts institution, but mm -hmm. isn't the world going in a different kind of direction with mm -hmm. interdisciplinarity? Mm -hmm. It might well be. Here we're invited people who really you know represent maybe branching out of Black Mountains also disciplines, people who are in the arts, practitioners, in the academia. Sadly, an architect whom we also invited could not make it. So it's kind of this, indeed, yeah? It's a kind of a narrow focus, if that's what you're getting at. But we hope really for this panel and also for this collaboration to really branch out eventually. I mean, this exhibition has shown in our panel also that there is a great desire and that there are many contact zones between the arts and the world beyond, beyond, even beyond the academia. Yeah? But this is just a starting point that we addressed here. And so my hope for the future of this would be that we sort of branch this out, that we elaborate further on means of collaborating. And I think Gabriele Knappstein is having the last word on this Yeah, I, I would like to just add that, um, and, and want to stress again, um, Lake Mountain College was not an art school. It was a liberal arts college, and the founders thought art uh, extremely important for general education and for um, critical and uh, open personality to then take any path in life that the person might take. And I think it will be very interesting in further research to also look into biographies of other students that came out of Black Mountain College and that took other professions than uh, being artists or uh, being writers, because I think they also took with them a lot of the impulses, be it in their profession as a city planner or there's a, a clinical psychologist who came out of uh, Black Mountain and an intense uh, friendship with Cage and others and I think this is completely open so far and it will be also um, when looking in those biographies I think uh, one will also find more um, aftermath of Black Mountain for 
the society and for um, movements in the 60s that uh, were very uh, important for, for the US and also came to Europe nationally. Um, and so there's another influence uh, that comes out of Black Mountain besides all the artistic uh, productions, which I think is also worth looking into and also more into the impulses the art students or the students that became artists took out of the other disciplines. Um, we only always mention uh, the very close uh, dialogue between the artist Dor Dorothea Rockburn and the mathematician Max Steen, which she uh, studied with intensely and it influenced her work uh, tremendously and also in her arguments when she speaks about her art uh, she clearly uh, starts from this uh, mathematician's teachings and I think other artists were influenced by anthropologists or by, by Charles Olsen as a poet and this is an influence This is also so far not really highlighted and more uh, research would have to be done in this field. Fantastic. Just sounds like a new project, yeah? And I hope we'll, I mean, we're ready to embark on this together. But I'd like to, first of all, thank all our panelists for their statements and the discussion and for being here and also for your questions. And I hope we can continue, you know, talking uh, in the coffee break, which is about to start now. So thank you very much. Break is a bit shorter.